Welcome back to Rich Check Podcast. Episode 55? Yeah. Double nickel. Ooh. <laughs> the number's so nice. You had to do it twice. We doubled up. Yep. Yes. Um, tonight, we have a special guest, and we have to be at a special place. Uh, we have Maxime with us of Song Blue. Welcome to the couch, sir. Thank you. It's an honor. Yeah. It's good to finally have you. I've heard a lot about you. Yeah. Um, we're going to get into some things tonight. It's going to be fun. And uh, we happen to be in a, in a very special venue. We're at Hublot yes. tonight. Yes. Uh, big shout out to our friends at Hublot for welcoming us in this evening. Uh, we're going to have a lot of fun talking about some watches and, and looking at some timepieces. Before we get to that, however, it's only right we have our honorary wrist check. And uh, as is tradition, <laughs> <laughs> the man who never repeats a watch yes. uh, is not repeating a watch tonight. What do you got in the wrist, sir? Um, so I have Maxime's uh, signature timepiece, the Song Blue Hublot. Um, I had to take a page from Ben's book and do diamonds. Okay. <laughs> um, so I don't think I've shared any um, gem set pieces on my wrist, nor have I really wore any or own any. You finally found one that fit you. I okay. found one that fits me. Thanks, nice. <laughs> this, is, this is a big boy. Um, I love it because... It's very hefty. Yeah. It's very flashy. Um, but it's got this mystique to it. Mm. Like you, you you don't you don't know what it is. Yeah. You know, you you're trying to figure it out. It's like with this like design and detailing, you got the asymmetrical going on, you know, you have like these integrated pushers, like which I've never seen integrated pushers. I've never seen pushers in a case. Yeah. It's crazy. We were talking about it off camera, it's like Man, this is a heck of a watch. Yeah, remember I picked up the watch and I was like, this is a chronograph? Yeah, <laughs> like, because you can see the pushes hit. It literally you can't is like. Tell. It, looks like it literally looks like it's part of the case. It's, yeah, it so, it's so stealth and camouflage. I was thinking about um, the um, the green ceramic, which, which you're wearing. And I was mm. like. Don't oh, spoil his wrist, Jack. <laughs> sorry. Um, but I was like, I got I to gotta do the one with the diamonds, something I've never done before. It's nice. I love the strap combo too. Yeah, yeah. it works. If it, it works with the fit too, like Ben has said. There you go. Yeah. Ben, what are you what are you rocking tonight? Uh, so Rashawn's known for never repeating the watch. I think I'm known for probably double wristing the most on the show. That's a fact. So uh, I am double wristing. I'm wearing on my left wrist a purple sapphire Hublot Big Bang tourbillon mm. with a micro rotor. Nice. The purple just so happens to be one of my favorite colors. This watch straight. Bangs. It's really good. I walked in here and Rashawn was like, look. <laughs> <laughs> and then on my right wrist, I'm wearing one of Maxime's Sang Blues. It's actually a lady size for Hublot. Um, it's right around 40 millimeters and it has a diamond bezel. I think it's nice. Black patent leather strap with Maxime's little personal touch on it. Mm. So it's something that even though it's a quote unquote ladies watch, it's definitely bigger. Men and women can pull it off. Yeah. And the dial is insane. It has a mystery seconds in the middle. You can't even tell it's moving until you stare at it. That's a running theme with, with these yeah. pieces, I too, think which a, I, I really think a, enjoy. I think a theme with these pieces is that you don't know what they are until you really study them. Mm. Yeah. Because, like, when these dials move, they overlap and they create so many patterns and unique shapes. It's it's crazy. Yeah. Seeing these in person is, is kind of insane. Yeah. I, too, am wearing um, one of the watches Maxime designed. This is the uh, Hublot Big Bang Sung Blue Green Ceramic. Um, this thing is awesome. You know, uh, it, it's, there's a lot going on. I, I love the design language. I love how there's, uh, there's a, a shared spirit between all of the different layers. And there's this, uh, there's something happening where, where things come together, but they're also separate, mm-hmm. right? They separate, but then they come back together. And there's like a rhythm that goes to it. That's really, really nice. Again, with those integrated pushers into the case, that's also a nice touch. There's a nice balance of symmetry and asymmetry. Again, running on that theme of like separateness, but then coming back together in unison, that I think is really, really nice. And, and, and that lends itself to like looking down at your wrist and never looking or seeing the same thing over and over again. Mm-hmm. There's like a constant evolution that's happening with this timepiece that I really, really enjoy. Um, what are you wearing on the wrist tonight, sir? Um, I am wearing, so one of the same is the Saint Bleu number no. two. Mm-hmm. So it's it's the ones uh, you guys have, you have the one, 
So there's there's a sort of timeline going on there. Um, and uh, just the black version. I mean, you you guys have already said some of the best, the you know, most compelling things. Okay. Like I'm, 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 <laughs> true, I'm enjoying this, not yeah. for the attention, but just because <laughs> I've put so much effort in that that I, you know, I I want people to be like, take a moment, and they'll be like, oh, I can't read the time or whatever. Like I've heard so many, mm. you know, things. I was like, okay, don't. It, yeah, then it's not. It's not for you. Yeah. Don't want to even worry. Yes. But um, you know, it's 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 really awesome because. That's how it's meant to be. So anyway, I have the black, the uh, black magic version, which is the black, not the all black. So it's the black with the um, metal screws uh, or the sort of metal color. And then I just, I just thought I would uh, uh, double wrist as well with one piece that I like very much. And you know, I, I did want to bring up at some point what I like about Ublo in particular and mm -hmm. why I connected with that mm -hmm. brand as before and especially as I started working with the brand because. Um, for me, Hublot was one of the early brands to really connect with things that were culturally appealing to me. Uh, and so this is the Sean Carter collaboration, uh, so Jay-Z. And, uh, and, you know, for me, the classic fusion is the original Hublot. That's yeah. the, even the pre-Jean-Claude Biver Hublot. Mm -hmm. That is kind of the, 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 that one model that was, I mean, it, had a few changes but uh the this yeah like the spirit in that sense like the the icon the icon historically and um so i love to wear those mm -hmm. it's still a big one it's a 45 millimeter uh we just checked uh orin uh the the shop director was uh saying it's probably 2014 um so that's that's the date and i really i love it i wear it extremely often both, of course, but I think it's a nice sort of contrast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's um, really cool. You know, of, of similar approaches, but with extremely different right. results. Yes. And, and things that, you know, again, like draw, drew, drew me to blow when I started mm -hmm. working with them uh, because other brands at the time when I started in, in the mid tens um, really didn't connect with things that I enjoyed and I could have I enjoyed the brands at the mm. time and the, the pieces for, for themselves but as far as seeing myself mm. interacting with the brand then uh, then yeah that's one thing that really sealed the deal as far as Hublot is concerned so that's the two pieces I have and uh, yeah it's really cool too is because I remember when this uh, Sean Carter piece came out but also like to see the evolution of the brand Hublot not, in, not only in terms of um, partnerships, but in terms of design language. You know, they're, they're obviously they're, in some ways they're world apart, but in some ways they do have the same spirit. You know what I'm saying? Just in terms of like materials used, being unafraid to like show an open work at that time where it wasn't really popular. You know what I'm saying? And now you're running with your own aesthetic and your own perspective trying to, what seems to, to be like share uh, higher conceptual ideas uh, through sort of an abstract lens, which I think is is, is really interesting. Um, so the the name of the line that you have with Ublo is Sang Blue, okay. uh, but Sang Blue is also a creative agency that you own and, and operate. Talk about what Sang Blue is for a little bit and and, and how it came about. So it's it's um. It's hard to define in a, in a few words because it really defines itself in what emanates of it, mm. if, if that makes sense. So I don't approach what Sombleu is with a set formula, but Sombleu started off as a kind of experiment. Mm -hmm. And so I brought here the, the magazine, which is the first thing I did it's just out of, after college. I studied uh, graphic design and, and type, type design, typography, and I uh, came out at a time when social media weren't, you know, replacing traditional media. It was yeah. still an era of magazines, mm. of zines. It was this, what I call the post-zine era mm -hmm. of uh, cultural magazines. So you had, you know, Days and Confused, to, oh, yeah. to name one of the most important ones, obviously the iconic one, but there were a myriad of magazines at that time, and mm. that's how I had approached my, my ability to to connect to anything growing up in Switzerland and in Europe in particular was through mm -hmm. magazines from skateboard culture to, to graffiti and, and hip hop in particular. 
uh, which were the things that I was I was into. But uh, so for me, it, it represented a window mm. into the world in a, in a way that was a lifeline for me growing up yeah. in a space that I didn't feel, you know, felt definitely suffocate, suffocating <laughs> a little bit, <laughs> you know. Um, and um, so anyway, that's kind of how it started. And, and I wanted to make this a sort of manifesto. So I put okay. everything I wanted in that project coming out of school. Um, and then, so at that time, I didn't tattoo. I didn't, you know, but I took everything that I liked and tried to mm -hmm. make it in a coherent shape. Um, and then I, the name came, came about, Sembleu meaning blue blood. Mm -hmm. It was a kind of take on bringing together a lot of things that are not typically considered as very noble or, or that I felt were, weren't really respected the way they should have been mm. culturally and to say, you know, F that, I'm yeah. going to call it noble, call yeah. it royalty, you know, so I did, you did, you know, I sort of, I, I went with that, that name, which had a, a bit of a wordplay as well, because the mm. magazine had tattooing in it, so there was a little bit of the blue of the ink, blood, sure. and then uh, tattooing, blah, blah, but it was not really about the, the literal wordplay or semantic play, it was really about this symbol of saying, we're appropriating that right. now, we're mm. calling it that, um, and then later, you know, fast forward, I, um, I started tattooing, being a tattooist myself, uh, and I opened tattoo studios that I named Son Bleu because it sort of just seemed, you know, that it would have been silly to, <laughs> <laughs> to call it anything <laughs> else. <laughs> um, and, then, uh, and then from there, it just became a sort of alter ego, almost, this sort of thing that I call things that I do, yeah. pretty much. So it sounds like there was sort of, there was a bit of a journey, right? Because here you are today with, with Sung Blue and, you know, you, you're a designer, you're an artist, you're all of these, these things, um, and you find yourself designing watches. You're the first Swiss gentleman we've had on the show, right? And uh, here in America, we have our, our preconceived notions of, of what Switzerland is like for those who have never been there because we see it from this like luxury perspective, but your perspective is, is very different, right? And it's, I think it's interesting how you kind of come full circle, right? Here's this Absolutely. place that you reside where this is like true working class culture, like people where we live, we make watches, that's what we do. And you're in search of something else, something with more meaning and I want to get into that because I know you studied some amazing things. Like you, you studied art, you did graffiti writing for a time. What do you think was going on in, in your immediate area that had you sort of like, let me get away from this and I'm in search of something sort of maybe greater than myself? It's a really good question. I think it's, I think it's a certain sense in the, as a kid in the 80s that like a strong sense that there's a world beyond, you know, Switzerland. But mm. Switzerland is both totally not necessarily like a lot more than what what we picture, but also like one can picture, but definitely also what what one can picture of like the postcard, you know, thing for sure. So there's there's definitely a bit of both and I think, you know, there's a, a near schizophrenia a little bit in Switzerland between between you know, that sort of like thing, how you need to present yourself, mm. like how mm. Switzerland needs to present itself because that's, you know, what it lives off. Mm. But also there's a whole backstage to that that is, that is different. It's real life and it's people with, you know, all kind of background or kind of situations. And, uh, and it's hard to be not, you know, when you don't fit exactly in the postcard right off the bat it's not necessarily a place that leaves a lot of room mm. for, you know, for other different approach. It's a small country with yeah. that sort of relies, relies on that. So I think what happened is I grew up definitely not fitting in mm -hmm. and, um, and with the strong, very quickly, I got the sense that, um, if I ever wanted, like, I didn't really resent the, the, my, childhood or the, the place I grew up in, but I, f I knew I could tell that yeah. I wouldn't be like that, the other kids. Da, da, da. So I needed to find a way to interact with it and to 
find peace mm. within in some ways, but then there was this sort of constant influx of pop culture and, and influences from the from the U.S. in particular. Yeah, I want to talk about that too because your your design style and then you talk about like the influences that you had with like tattoo culture and graffiti writing and even hip hop. And there's something I think that is like kind of uniquely hip hop about your approach in in the in the ability that you have as an artist to pull different elements from all of these different places and sort of bring them together. Where did that come from? Yeah, I like I like that. There's a sort of visual sampling almost yeah. sort of process that for me is very today is kind of obvious to anyone like any kid wanting to do anything artistic will just lift things off like trade you know whether it's music or, or, or artistic you know just like take something that exists and and build on it mm -hmm. it's something that is is the main way people do things today i feel whereas it was very unique and unheard of back back in the day um you know when back then and even even in music you know you had all those like people didn't know what to do with sampling from even a legal standpoint and mm. and like mm. Da, da, da. And so I think that uh, for me, I quite quickly realized that that was the way I could interact with keeping a sort of safety distance okay. to those things, like being able to take it, but also it's not because I take something even visually, like if I, if I tattoo something that I, and I use a, a, a reference, that will be a historical reference, whether, you know, a, a painting or, or an illustration, I will use it as a base or as or elements of it, but it's not because I you I work with it that mm. I have to take it all and accept everything that comes with it. And I think um, I think hip hop in that sense showed that you could do that, and uh, and also that it didn't mean that you had to to sort of give into or accept the whole package, mm. and that that it was okay to even be critical or use it to sort of even make it say the opposite sometimes of was it initially intended. Mm. And I thought that was extremely compelling and, uh, and, and, and that had, yeah, that was something that mm. I could, could use as a principle behind my creation. Yeah. You had a question? Well, listening to, to just like your early childhood, um, I could see that, you know, you were not like most of the kids that were there or I don't know if you had like any peers or like a crew of like guys that kind of seen what you saw. Um, because when you talk about hip hop, especially 80s, 90s, you know, I think uh, very rebellious, NWA, bad boy like you know those kind of like groups mm -hmm. Wu-Tang etc which was very prolific in the time period that you're talking about were you like crewed up or like clicked up did you have people that were like like-minded like yourself or was it just like Lone Ranger in Switzerland <laughs> <laughs> it, it was a bit of both but what is interesting is back then um I'm actually, it starts even before we time we, we're talking about, you know, Public Enemy and mm -hmm. the Daisy, yeah, exactly. Daisy Age, yes. like, you know, and the early, you know, Native Tongues, etc. And, um, and, and back then there was a sort of budding thing in Europe. So again, pre-internet, mm -hmm. where Africa Bambata actually had come to Europe and started chapters of the Zulu Nation yeah. in, in different countries. Mm -hmm. And there was the main one uh, in Germany. So I was part of the Zulu Nation um, from a very young age and sort of revolving mm. around that. So we're talking about even, yeah, pre-Wu-Tang, not quite pre-NWA, but really pretty much, yeah, like the very early stages of, yeah. of that. So there were little crews, but at the time it was, you know, it was not something you could just... It was a different was, time. You can't People would be confused. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was like you had to do be doing something. Yeah. You had to like talk to the older guys and they, they had to be to say, Hey, you're okay, you know, you yeah. you're good to yeah. and you can just like dress the way you wanted or like wear anything uh, you wanted. So it was and it was cool because you really taught me from a very young age. I remember going at twelve, maybe yeah, around twelve I went to a, a specific school and uh 
and yeah, like you had to earn the right to wear, you know, certain shoes mm -hmm. or to, to, you know, dress in a certain way. Like you had to be b-boying or, or writing. You had to be involved in the culture somehow, somewhere. Yeah, yeah. and then so the, those guys were there. They were like b-boys and, and a lot of, you know, tagging and yeah. graffiti and all. But what was cool as well is that even, and what, what was a similarity that I found in, um, between tattooing and, and even graffiti is that once you had been validated once you have been like okay you're okay just do your thing then you also had the right to you know really kind of copy some people you know if you were in a crew you you know you could work in a certain style you could you know use some shapes mm. for the for your letters that an og you know another person or your mentor kind of w was doing same with tattooing you know once you sort of earned your stripes you could you can really work in the style yeah. that someone else is doing, and that's also what happened to me with, with tattooing. It's like, it's like so making a flash sheet in tattoos. Exactly, yeah. and this is where there's a sort of element of even sampling and, mm. and continuing something. And like, and and back then, again, like pre pre Instagram, pre all of that, Europe had even each country, each region had a graffiti style. Like, so in the very early '90s, you had a sort of German Swiss style that was really a thing going on, but Paris had its own style of writing and the hip hop was already really big in Paris, uh, in, in France, but Paris in particular, where, you know, tags were, had a, a definitely a certain style. So on my side of Switzerland, people were more influenced by France and, and on the other side, they were more on the Germany side, but then, and, uh, and then it started t taking over and then it's, it's much later that thing, things sort of started evening out mm. in terms of influence. Back then, we had no idea what was going on in America. Yeah. I mean, oh. no idea what kind of graffiti style or, I mean, we knew the music, yeah. but the music didn't, we had, even then, early, late 80s, they, they, some people started making French, rap in French. So there were f groups of, of French rap, French speaking rappers in, in Belgium, in France, and, and in my side of Switzerland. So it was really this sort of m tiny microcosm of hip hop European style. And yeah. then it sort of got stretched mostly because of the music, of the influence of the music that came from the US that had cultural references and, and certain things that were very specific to the US. And I remember the sort of, the sort of uh, <laughs> cognitive dissonance of the, the kind of more like old school, uh, you know, peace, unity, and having fun yeah. guys like <laughs> when they were hearing, you know, gangster yeah. rap or whatever. Yeah. And, and I was into those genres as well, but they, they didn't want to hear that. They were like, that's not what hip hop is. I was like, eh, you know, that's not what your hip hop is. But yeah. That's, yeah. So. Yeah. Wow. It's so interesting because I, I really, I'm enjoying where this conversation is going because I think for a lot of people, I think oftentimes people don't give consideration how the arts are similar in different mediums. Yeah. Right? And so hearing you talk about initially like your appreciation for elements and then saying, well, I don't have to use all of it, but I can make it mine. And in the same way you describe your experience with hip hop, and I think what I see in a lot of the, the art that you, you create, there is an appreciation for tradition. You don't run away from tradition, you accept tradition, you embrace it, but you you also seem to like to sort of break the mold, put it back together and recreate it, right? To, to turn it into something new, to turn it into something fresh, maybe to give people another lens at looking at it that they haven't considered before. And I see that a lot in, in, in the work that you're doing with, with Song Blue. And going back to talking about your, your graffiti writing days, I, I assume that led to the company uh, Swiss Typeface. Correct. Would so, you? yeah, I think that that's an, that's an interesting sort of uh, segue. segue and <laughs> transition because... It's just Nardwar now. <laughs> <laughs> Boom! <It's good>. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, because, yeah, like I think letters and... It's something very present in, in Switzerland and um, in, in sort of the Germanic side, so typography in general. And um, and I think I realized at some point that my love for letters in general, I I had it through graffiti and tagging, but then 
then as soon as I started knowing what typography was and actual type design, mm -hmm. I was like, that's, that's my thing, of course, 100%. So I went to school and uh, I, I showed in my, um, I don't know what you call that, the thing you Like present. a portfolio. Yeah, the portfolio. Um, I showed some letters I was, I was drawing and I was not trying to do, I was like, I mean, uh, and, the, and one of the main guys at the school was like, oh, you actually draw letters? I was like, yeah, I love letters. Um, <laughs> you know, kind of keeping, like, kind of trying to gauge, like, if I could talk about graffiti, but, like, and, and that guy is some sort of, like, insane purist nerd type designer. And he was like, that's crazy. Like, there's someone who actually likes it. Usually mm. they have to kind of force feed it to mm. art student. Like, typography is the least sexy kind of <laughs> thing, you know. <laughs> well, at least back then. Now, sure. now it's a bit more, more trendy, but uh, back then it was not, not cool. It was all just like weird nerds doing it. <laughs> um, so I was like, you know, he, so he was so happy and kind of like took me under his wing or like really kind of wanted me to, to continue on that, which I happily did. And that's how... So, but it, but coming back again, so th with the, the segue, but like linking back up to the, to the hip hop thing, I think that um, my, so I studied type design, but then fresh out of school, the first thing I did was to start a company. Mm. And the instinct that business would be a, a, a crucial component of my ability to create that I needed to have the means and the ends yeah. in that sense, mm. really came from this sort of completely, you know, uh, uh, open and, and, and shameless approach that, that in particular with, with rap music, where, you know, money and business is talked about mm -hmm. and is part of like the thing. And, and, and there is zero contradiction, there's like nowhere near the, 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 there's nowhere the notion that um, that it could be, and contradicting the the, the 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 sincerity or the purity of the art itself. It's funny which that hip hop that way. It was art and commerce acknowledge one another yes. very openly. Yes, and this is something. This is such a stigma in the old world, definitely. Mm -hmm. But you know, I feel that this is like a sort of taboo that that hip-hop was like not even bothering with at all mm. and that I always felt growing up that, that there was an issue with the fact that you had people who create stuff and then people who take what they make yeah and go like <laughs> make money with it and yeah. like hey do you want some money for your thing and it always felt wrong mm. one way or another and I was like I, I don't want someone else to, to be yeah. doing this for me so immediately I started a company I had no idea what I was doing mm. Oh, I mean, some ideas, but sure. you know, completely. <laughs> uh, and uh, and yeah, so that's exactly what happened with Swiss Type Faces, which was my first entrepreneurial project. That's um, amazing. Yeah. That's awesome. Did your Did your parents like how? Cause you Cause you're a father. I mean, I could assume that your children probably was like cool dad, because <laughs> you are <laughs> cool as heck. So like you know, you're cool dad. So maybe you're a little bit more accepting to you know your children want to pursue their dreams because your dreams came true. In the beginning, did your parents kind of see the direction you were going for them to support it or to not? That's a good question. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that, but I also would say they didn't, I think they, you know, didn't understand really, but they kind of, they, they, they themselves had like they didn't want to go against it and so they didn't go against it and then and for them it was already you know a lot i think it's, it's uh, all new territory for them they yeah, didn't yeah, see anything 100%. like this before and there was zero like zero blueprint for any exactly any yeah. of that mm. so you know it's kind of if down to the the style of tattooing that i do which is now one of the one of these styles that you know a huge part of of the tattoo industry is doing even that style didn't exist when mm. I started doing it and I'm not going to credit myself for inventing it but I was definitely among the few people who actually took elements that we saw around us and constituted it as a style that you know some people have called black work it's not really a, time, a, a term that's used and I don't even like it but that's that's kind of a, a term that has been used for a while to, to describe that 
And um, so anyway, I think that the fact that there wasn't any blueprint definitely was scary. Mm. And as far as my <laughs> children are concerned, like, you know, I can tell, you know, it's funny. You, you all of a sudden, when you have kids, you start, fight, you start fighting yourself kind of yeah. more conservative. Or yeah, <laughs> no, tell me about you it. You fancy yourself, you're like, <laughs> all right, well, you know, why don't you take a safe? Yeah, it, it hasn't been easy. Sure. You know, yes. for me, it's been, I've been lucky and, you know, I worked hard and I've been also privileged on a lot of things. And so anyway, but I wouldn't say, you know, I didn't really have a backup plan. It was sure. my, my, was that's the only a, plan. Had plan A was plan B, you know, plan <laughs> So, um, but I wouldn't say like, I wouldn't tell someone, hey, yeah, like go do that. You know, I'd, it'd, it'd be hard to. Even when I take apprentices, so my kids are young, so and of course we'll support them whatever they want to do. But when I take apprentices, for example, when I have in the past, I'm a bit tired for that. Um, but um, I have told people like, just look at them in in their eyes and be like, don't don't. Are you sure you want to be a tattooist? What like why are you doing this? Like mm. there, there's no good reason to be a tattooist except that you don't have any reason and you still want to do it. Mm. Then maybe. You should do it. Do you know, do you know I what understand I mean? what you mean. And, and you, you, there's not, nothing rational. There's You're nothing compelled. reasonable about yeah. You have to like, yeah. it's that or nothing else, which is how I felt for the things I did. And I've done a lot of stuff that didn't quite work the way I was hoping, but they ended up building up to, to what comes, uh, is, is, you know, what is today. But like, you know, it hasn't been easy. So, mm. but anyway, yeah. I want to talk a little bit about um, your approach to design mm -hmm. um, and sort of get a sense of how you see the world around you and how that is somehow mirrored in the work that, that you're creating because you're creating so many different things, right? You, outside of like you, you, the tattooing and we talked about the graffiti writing, uh, Swiss typeface, you know, Song Blue is an amazing uh, creative resource for you, right? Because you're able to create clothing, you're creating media, and you have this amazing partnership with Hublot. Um, how is, is everything the same for you in terms of your approach, or are they different? Are you segmenting? No, watches are different from fashion. Fashion is different from media. Like. How are you looking at these objects? Okay, that's that's a that's a great question. And um, I think that especially today, I have it. It's been to my endeavor. My my mission has been to bring everything together in an increasingly coherent form. Mm. So when when look if you look at the magazine you have the raw it's like it's like giving you the the recipe but not telling you how to cook the, yeah. the ingredients together right. and my life has been since so it's 15 years pretty much since the magazine has been slowly learning to cook all of those different ingredients together in something that is a cohesive recipe mm -hmm. or a whole menu maybe mm -hmm. but so the answer to this is that I'm still on that quest to, to a large extent. There's still things that I'm working, slowly working at combining and, 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 and cooking together in that thing that is cohesive. But <clears throat> I think that the watches, and this is where, you know, I think there's the watches to a large extent have been one of the most What's the word? Achieve, uh, in French, you say achevé, which means like finished, kind of, like kind complete. of, yeah, yeah, complete form of bringing together all of the things that are liked, and and that includes so, it, and it includes everything. So earlier you were talking about how the different, how for example the pushes yes. are part of mm -hmm. the the shape uh, or of the design, and I, I'm loving this because that's exactly how it is and or how the layers work. So mm -hmm. essentially for me, watches, watches of course they tell you the time, but you know, watches they're kind of, they're, f they're almost like a sort of fetishized thing. Yeah. They're like, and, and of course we like watches that have, that become just a, 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 
a medium that you put things on top, mm -hmm. like whether there's jewelry or uh, or images or like shapes, da da da. But really, what I wanted to do, and that's the same way I approach tattooing in general, is I'm not trying to put an image on the body. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to create a new body, yeah. a new body mm -hmm. image. And I, w I didn't want to take a, take a watch as just a kind of blank page that I will just, just like put things on top. My, what I wanted to do is to break down every element that are part of the watch, that make the watch, yeah. and see how they can be adjusted to become a cohesive mm -hmm. thing, but where I intervene as deeply as I can in what exists, not adding things that are not needed. Mm. So. So essentially, it's a kind of extracting shapes and things that exist in the watch as it is, yeah, without, without adding. And as much as, so, because that's for me, otherwise you might as well buy jewelry. Yeah. yeah. You know <laughs> what I mean? Yeah. Like, you don't need a watch if yeah. you're going to make it a jewel. It's funny, you have your design, um, to see the watches and, and the similarities and how they're different, there's almost a really cool balance between like minimalism and like overstimulation. Yeah. And, but it, it, it expands and contracts. It mm -hmm. goes back and forth, right? Because like when you look at like even the one that I'm wearing, like to make the pushers part of the case is like a minimalist idea. It's like how do yeah. we subtract everything into one? It's a minimalist idea. It's but then everything being as layered as it is in like, uh, it, it brings a level of like dynamism to it that those ideas should not coexist mm -hmm. in the same place, but somehow for you they do. And that's you know, that's that's a wonderful explanation because because and that is where like I'll also sort of tie back in with you know my my cultural background. Modernism yeah is the idea to a large extent in design that shape function is is the the shape mm -hmm. like function decides the shape of things but you know so there's there's and, and it's something that is really heavy and, and and embedded in where i grew up mm. the idea you know pretty much the the, the creator of Bauhaus you know yeah. Le Corbusier architectural design modernism uh artistic modernism in, in Europe and that is something that I really grew up with, but I grew up with that next to, you know, medieval cathedrals yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, punk music and yeah. crazy, you know, and then like with everything that came with punk or goth and, and, and then, you know, in hip hop, the bling, you know, the, the Dapper Dan and, yeah. you know, and like, so my taste is I love this sort of intensity, the bar Baroque almost mm. thing that I grew up in and I'm half Italian. So like the, the, the sort of intense kind of Latin, you know, like Mediterranean, yeah. like Catholic, you know, churches yeah. Da, 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 yeah. Yeah. That, I, that, you know, I love. And then with this sort of like, okay, that's great but everything needs to make sense. <laughs> yes, yes, you know yes, what I mean? Yes. And, yes. and you put yourself in the cooker oven. Like, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, it is the worst because the, those things historically col collided and, and were almost, well, fighting. Like yeah. they, they were literally like, if you, get, you know, it's pretty much the Protestant versus Catholic mm -hmm. kind of yes. antagonism. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, and that, you know, I felt culturally, I was kind of in the middle. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and, and just as a, you know, funny little, my, my grandmother, who was Italian, grew up in Italy, so like heavily Catholic place mm. as a prote Protestant herself. Mm. So it's a very bizarre, almost, you know, schizophrenic thing yeah. going on that I've been looking to bring together. And, and you asked me um, yesterday about sacred geometry and we talked about abstraction in that yeah. sense. And this is what I like about abstraction because it can be entirely justified mm -hmm. or, or rationalized but it can be made and turned into something that can become as complex and as yep. baroque as, as possible and then ultimately it's something that is found in any human culture mm -hmm. like the, the simplification of shapes faces from 
cave paintings mm -hmm. to any mm. any sort of traditional art anywhere you have uh, an idea of simplifying shapes to make them a sort of generic shape for animals humans spirits whatever and um so the, the, the human mind can project itself on shapes mm -hmm. yeah. like it can on a, on a Rorschach test, on an mm -hmm. Engelart test. And this is, this is what I'm looking for in the shapes I create is something where you can look at it. So, and you know, again, you've put perfect words on it where you can look at it and be like, I can see anything pretty much or like different moments, I'll see different things mm -hmm. and all of them are perfectly valid. Mm -hmm. yeah. it, it, it's, it's absolutely meant to be like that. And I, I just have sort of carefully kind of just, you know, stayed. I'm just a little careful with that certain symbols don't appear or that, yes. you know, it doesn't look too much like one culture or another, but like it's always kind of border, bordering. Which things. is probably the hardest thing to do, right? Yeah. You're trying to balance all of those elements that in most people's minds were never supposed to exist together in the first place. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And even like that, that's, that's funny because you, you'll definitely get, you know, if you, if you take the, the Sombler one, mm -hmm. it's based, um, so the, the, um, the, the, the hands are based on squares that are, that are overlapping. So, um, so traditionally you'll get this sort of like, you know, four, eight, you know, 12 kind of, you mm. know, as you overlap, you'll yeah. have the sort of multiples. Um, and, but the square shape is, is a bit more present in Islamic art, mm -hmm. for example. Um, whereas, whereas the, the, the more, you know, here you have, uh, so in, in the Sombre 2, I based myself on um, triangles, on mm -hmm. equilateral mm -hmm. triangles. So then you have, you know, the three, six, nine you know and and then it sort of crosses at at 12 where where the the four multiples right. and, the, and the three multiples uh overlap so anyway the 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 so it makes sense so the three is more present actually in in western uh, yep. uh in, in western arts and western um uh, spirituality where so anyway so even things like this i have been looking so even though you have both but i have made sure on that one that you get all the way to 12 angles so that it's not entirely, you know, the, the eight and the four and eight kind of multiples that mm -hmm. would have made it very sort of Islamic looking. Mm -hmm. And it's completely irrelevant uh, in the sense that, I, I mean, I could demonstrate it with a drawing, but, you know, the point is, is that you can see it in there. Yeah. Because it is there, yeah. but it, there's also <laughs> other things in there, there as well. There as but well. it is a thought process yeah. that addresses it at every step. Mm -hmm. Was it intentional to have the Shang Blue one as a time only and the two as a chronograph? Did that play into the design language of the shapes? It did. Yeah, absolutely. Because one of the so I didn't I didn't choose that. I mean, I did, didn't have. Uh, so the reason why. Um, no, so I didn't make that decision of chrono time only mm -hmm. versus chrono, um, but it did influence for the, for the simple reason that here you need to have the subdials, right. mm -hmm. and, and therefore I had to sort of make sure that the the, the shapes would allow to see uh, the subdials, and um, and I created you know and, and and I had to do the layering in different ways, um, so yeah, it influenced it absolutely you know, very heavily, yeah. um, absolutely. And the other thing too, I mean, especially with the saying blue tube, because the chronograph, all the shapes that make up the sub dials in the hands, when we post the photos of these watches and people see them, they're going to think, how the hell can you read time yeah. on that? <laughs> yeah. But when your hour hands overlap any of the sub dials, you can see everything you clearly see still. At every, at yeah. every it's like they position. line up perfectly. It doesn't mm -hmm. matter where your second hands is, where your chronograph counter is, you see everything. Yeah. yeah. And uh, like what well, Perry was saying earlier, that's probably the hardest part, doing all these things that look very complex when they're on their own and then when they get together it's just it's like one like synonymous thing yeah and i have to say this is one thing as well and probably you know the the, the swiss sort of nerdiness but uh um i i hate i hate watches that have a bad bad layout mm -hmm. so where like the information is is the where the, the sort of semiotics of mm -hmm. of 
And I think certain brands do it extremely well, expe especially for high complications, yeah. you know, very high complications. And some others kind of struggle. Yeah. And there's like, <laughs> or, or even on, I mean, you know, that's one of the, my pet peeves or even on, on car dashboards or whatever right. with like, you know, when the buttons don't make sense or yeah. like, you know, you want to press somewhere and it's not, it, it doesn't work like anyway. So, so yeah, absolutely. This is, this is the, and this is where, you know, my, my brain sort of clicks with this kind yeah. of stuff. Yeah. What's it, uh, what's it mean to you to have this partnership with, with Ublo? You know, you're, you're, you're part of a, a, a tradition now it seems right like when i think of hublot i think of a brand that is um unafraid to take risks right uh, likes to partner with people who love to take risks love to try new things i mean you're following in tradition of john claude viver right who is sort of in some circles the bad boy of watches but everyone loves him <laughs> so what does it mean to have uh this partnership and and for them to allow you to to use their canvas means everything I yeah. mean, f for me it has been one of the most meaningful things of my professional career and artistic career and and you know and as long as they you know as long as our interests align like I have you know I have another 20 watches you know, <laughs> in my yeah. mind. well you have a new ready, watch coming out ready for them but yeah sure, with them sure right do. so this is Segway. the yeah <laughs> yes. the sun blue uh, if we call it the three, yeah, that's the three. Okay, this is wow. So, well, well, I'm curious, like, what you got coming for this one? What was the inspiration behind this uh, this third iteration? So, when at the time people see this, yes. um, it will be releasing um, on that, you know, pretty much then. Um, so it's it's a huge deal for me because mm. for a lot of reasons because those watches have been with the the sort of time the the time scale that they're on so having you know three four years in between right that's pretty much you know how much time there's between my kids being born and and it's oh, wow. a sort of life wow. cycles happen you know when you're an adult yeah. with at a certain speed as a certain pace i feel and it's kind of you know that that pace as well with watches um so what, what so, so there's two, two things happening simultaneously with, with the, this one coming out, there's the, the desire to create something cohesive and to establish what the Sondler line is mm. and say like, hey, we can continue to build on that, on those principles, on the, this aesthetic. And, you know, now it's become its own visual design language mm -hmm. and it can be built upon mm -hmm. as much as we want while still be coherent and um and that is really what what i think branding in general and especially with watches there's always that sort of idea like are we truly dealing with this brand or that brand what is the essence mm. of this brand or that brand you know that's the always the question right, right. and uh from you know pricing to sizing to like techniques and complications that it up and um and I think for me what is very special is that we we sort of we have now a sort of steady base for what the Sombre vision line or the idea is that's for one and then the other important thing is that each watch also works with its own time and we you know we love the watch industry we follow it we see how it changes and uh people want different things at different time and there's yeah. also that 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 sort of testimony of a certain of a certain moment in time for the the watch watch culture and and watch collectors and so the the new one is based on uh the so-called spirit of big bear mm. which is the tonneau de chic mm. that ali that hublot has been doing which i've always loved tonneau uh shake because it is extremely ergonomic mm -hmm. and i love ergonomic cities uh, I have you know one thing that I would actually that I've been looking into is to get old no not, not even that old but like, uh, uh, Nike's been doing you know the sort of weird like science fiction looking watches since the the, the late 2000s baby oh, oh yeah, yeah. Now, some amazing look he collects some of them 
Oh, really? <laughs> it's like how Oakley watches and stuff, too. Yeah. Oh, yeah, those are coming back. Oh, 100%. And Crazy. I've I've loved those ever ever since. So my, yeah. my taste really ranges from from the super traditional, you know, Philippe Dufour, like all mm -hmm. the way to, to the those, to yeah. Nike, Oakley, whatever. Sure. And so for me, um, the turn of shit, like the, the ergonomics mm -hmm. of the, the watches were very important. I wear watches. I yeah. have my whole life. And if a watch just doesn't fit well, ah, you know, there's that moment of the day where like, <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I didn't want that. Yeah. And I, so I don't, you know, I'm very sensitive to the weight, to the way it sits, to the, does it turn? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, mm -hmm. the size, for example, like, does it fit? Does it keep hitting the, the... so, you know, I think um, for me, one thing that is very important is already between the two and the, and the one, um, one thing that we did was, um, to adjust, so the one with a 45 millimeter uh, often kind of on, on smaller wrists was the sort of flat part was was a bit too wide there. Okay. So I insisted on the fact that we could shorten this. Ooh. So here you see that the, the this the circle here is is sort of tripped like truncated oh yeah, yeah i see it oh, i see and and the angle of the lugs is is much sharper here mm -hmm. and that was something where i was like okay we're gonna keep this size cool it's but it's almost like you're folding the lugs in a little Absolutely. bit just to get a, even a little bit more mm -hmm. um make it a little bit more flush yeah and, and yeah. hug the wrist yeah so that was already what we did between the one and the two i was like we, we need to do this. Mm. We need, you know, the, 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 the straps are pretty thick, you know, they don't bend that much. We, we need this kind of thing. And so for the third one, which is based on a 42 millimeters uh, shape, which is also much more kind of ergonomic in itself, um, I wanted that even more. So you'll see on the, on the third one, maybe we'll have some images to, to show. Um, it, it's even more mm. like that. It's a slightly, you know, smaller shape as well. And I wanted something that feels that it grew out of the body. Yeah. yeah. Mm. You know, I wanted that. I want, I want something, same with, with the tattoos I do. I want it to be both a thing in itself, because I, if, if we're going to do something that is just, you know, like, a, you know, we don't need to change the body if it's mm -hmm. to do something that's completely right. expected. But I want something that also feels that it could have grown out of you. Mm. So it's, it's that kind of, that's you really know, cool. augmented body kind of experience yeah. and that's I love that in you know design is a there's a level of expression right you're trying to get out these ideas that you have and then b it's like solving problems but I love like how when you're a designer and you're actually in the middle of creating something there are other problems that come up that you have to find solutions <laughs> for <laughs> of course I think that's cool um you know when we were talking um prior to the, the cameras running at one point, we were, we talked about the idea of um, sort of purity, mm -hmm. right? And I remember one of the things that you mentioned, you said, you know, what you love about Hublot is that they're not a purist brand. Talk about that a little bit. What I mean by that is that there's no loyalty to your sort of I idea that would hold you back. Yeah. Like there's no, there's no like, oh, we can't do that. It's I like, don't imagine you hear the words can't very much from Uvo. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. That, that, that's, uh, I want to hear like, of course, let's figure it out. Yeah. And, and then, you know, nine times out of ten, it, it's not relevant. Right. But the only, the only criteria is relevancy. Mm. You know, relevancy, including relevancy to the brand. There's, there's a lot of things that I might do differently in theory but it's irrelevant. I wouldn't do it yeah. if it, you know. I, I wouldn't be interested to do it by myself. Right. I'm interested mm -hmm. also because it feeds my. It it, it 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 sort of triggers my imagination to have to deal with those things and have to think within you know a brand like this, which is even you know, w which is a a huge endeavor, a huge company, obviously with people there. You know, I've I've, I've and it's and it's awesome. Over the years, I have created amazing relationships with the teams there um, from Stefan, for example, who's the, the, the sort of 3D, I don't remember, I don't, 
product developer, mm -hmm. the person who really does the sort of 3D modeling mm -hmm. with me, who has, mm -hmm. you know, who knows, and who who has at that point in our relationship, it's amazing. I can I can tell him words, and he'd be like, I, I yeah, get, I got, got you, I, I understand. That's awesome. And he, you know, and, and a few hours later, or a few days later, he sent me a visual, and I'm like, that's yes. it. <laughs> that, was, that was it. You understand me. And that's awesome. And it's the same with the, the, the marketing teams or whatever, like we were just now working on the, the launch in Milan, and uh, uh, Moran, who's the, my chaperone mm -hmm. uh, in the marketing team was like, she's the one who, who came up with that idea. And I was like, heck yeah. Like yeah. That's, that's spot on for what I want to do. I think it's, it, it contextualizes the watch differently, mm -hmm. but in a way that's not too much of a stretch, you know, being enough, because it's a, it's a, a furniture design. Um, okay. Uh, fair. Um, uh, yeah, it's kind of like Fashion Week, but for furniture design mm -hmm. in Milan. And I was like, yes, that, that says about the watch exactly what it needs to be said about it. Um, and she's the one who came up with it. I was like, that's awesome. I, I couldn't <laughs> have I had a, a better idea. Mm -hmm. and, um, and now, you know, we've been working on everything that comes with it. Same with the, the people who did, uh, I don't know if you, if you saw the little movie. Um, I did, I watched yeah. it, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, I sent a bunch of, so for the, Second issue for the the second one, um, second one, we I produced a, a movie for the for the launch, um, which I'll, I'll send you as well, which was really fun where we completely produced Ensemble, my agency produced it for for this purpose, and this time you know they did it in house, and and just again like they had the sort of elements that we had done before, and uh, you know we constantly send them. Uh, designs and, and whatnot, like we're creating visuals for the boutiques, and uh, and they came up with the film. I was like, first time almost. I don't have much to say. That's it's awesome. Like, <laughs> so, but this is such a bizarre feeling yeah. to not have you know things to say about something. I was like, it's awesome. Maybe the first sequence, you know, you can make it a little bit longer, but that's about it. And so it's it's really awesome. It means it means a lot. And to be honest, also back to the conversation of my sort of unusual path. It's my first very conclusive experience in a in a in a corporate right. kind of environment, which right. is not what I'm known to thrive in, yeah. uh, to say the least. And this is I mean, most one artists time. aren't right? exactly. So, yeah. um, so I have to say, it's yeah, it's a, it's awesome. Like, there's nothing I would do. You had something, sir? No, no, no. no. Just listening. Sure. <laughs> I, the the funniest thing is, you know, when when we do have guests on the couch and, and, and we're talking, um, I find myself very visual. I like I I picture what you speak. So I don't I don't hear what you say, I see what you say. Um which which sometimes um is interesting because it's it's layers, like you said. Yeah. You know, well, everything and I shared is the very video synonymous. with these yeah. guys too. So it's like almost as you're speaking, I'm I'm also yeah, re visualizing yeah. the video in my head. Yeah. Um, you know, it's interesting, your partnership with Hublot. I think I find Hublot in a, in a really unique space that I don't, I can't think of any other watch companies that find them in. And where I'm going with this is it almost seems like, especially with like the Big Bang, they're, they've opened up an atelier, right? Because when I think about like your partnership with them and the amazing things that you're doing, you look at what they're doing with Takashi Murakami. You look at what they're doing with Samuel Ross. I think this is a, this is a pretty interesting place that they found themselves in. Um, considering, you know, what you have going on with Hublot and where Hublot is going, um, what is, I guess, your sort of critique of where the watch world seems to be going? Are they aligned? Are they moving into separate, you know, places? What's your point of view? That's yeah. I'm 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 glad you're bringing this up, and I, I don't wanna. I don't know if we have all night to debate <laughs> where where the watch industry is going today. Yeah. Um, I have a lot of opinions on on that as well. It's a you know, two years ago I would have had some things to say, and you know I would have had a much more I think defined impression. Like I feel post COVID. The, the cards have been reshuffled a little bit. Mm. I feel that we're still, you know, there's a lot of things up in the air, like people waiting to see where the dust settles. 
uh, as far as, you know, we were talking about the auctions, for example. Yeah. And I think that, um, you know, pre-COVID or during COVID, you know, you had certain types of pieces being like, you know, the go-to, like whatever, the Paul Newmans, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, they had very specific things going on in the auctions. And I feel like between shifts in the, the community, shifts that may be kind of strategic from the brands as well with, you know, for example, Patek deciding to stir away a little bit from the Nautilus line mm -hmm. and stuff like this, which was had been announced by right. for, for years and years. So we, you, you know, no, everyone knew that was, and now it's here. Yeah. Right. Um, so I feel that there's a lot of interesting, we, we had definitely an, a, a point of inflection yeah. on, a, on a lot of levels. What I find, you know, uh, what I find exciting is the journey of a lot of people who, you know, have always disliked and resented to some extent the, the sort of, even the, the notion of hype watches. Yeah. Like, who cares? It's a, you know, good watch is a good watch. Like, mm -hmm. and, and people, you know, on other podcasts even kind of, whatever. <laughs> whatever. Um, you know, like influential <laughs> people in the watch world kind of be like, oh, I'm so tired of people asking me about, you know, not, not to listen or whatever. Sure. Anyway, um, I, think, I think ultimately what it did do is that it got a lot of people interested genuinely interested in watches it did. and educated mm -hmm. and willing to be like okay well i might that might be my entry point but now show me like yeah. now let, 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 let's do this and i think that needs to be celebrated the same way for me you know there's a lot of things that need to be talked about and need to be or at least at least acknowledged and kind of you know the for me the role that since since the early 2000s, the, the role of aftermarket, mm. you know, uh, gem setting, especially, you know, rappers getting in their, their, their watches uh, uh, blooded, bust, <laughs> bust down, etc. <laughs> and the fact that today we went from gem set watches uh, being kind of this sort of thing that some people do and da da da, to being the, the first thing that all the most prominent brands do. Mm -hmm. Like having, you know, and, and it was a lot of uh, investment in gem sets sex. this year. Yes, it was. <laughs> I mean, oh, the, oh yeah. the, the tech buying of uh, Santa Nitro, whatever it's called. Yes, yeah. Santa Nitro. Yeah. And, uh, and I think that even when you look at it, like the, the, the uh, 5271P uh, Patek, for example, that was always, it was a sort of, it existed and mm -hmm. it was a, as a gem set. Um, and all of a sudden it's launched like that's the hero yeah. product mm. and Ruby's which is which is like sapphire. a half a million dollar watch like yeah. all of a sudden so anyway i just i just want to say like for me that's that's awesome but i think it's important to also acknowledge where it came from yes. Absolutely. And, and and for me that's the same way with with hype watches and and all that like i think now if the watch in, the watch industry has an opportunity to renew itself mm. to really live off this new blood, this new interest that it has, but also in people need to be feel welcomed in it yeah. and not just like, oh, looked, oh yeah, you another hype watch guy, like, you know, <laughs> kind of look, yeah. look down upon. Yeah. No, just, that's awesome. Come come to our gathering and, and, and we'll, yeah. we'll talk. Yeah. And anyway, so I, I thought it was really interesting to see some very high complication things becoming also the, the focal points for a lot of new releases and people getting into those. I, I found myself wanting the, you know, some high complication sure. pieces that I can't afford yet, but like, <laughs> you know, minute repeaters, um, you know, grand sonnerie, like all the, you know, and the combinations, you know, there are. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so I think it's, it's awesome. I'm not sure why, what my point was, but I think, <laughs> oh yeah, no, so where the watch industry is. Yeah. So I think that's, that's awesome. And I think that I've seen a lot of very interesting work being done by Patek in particular, not to, but with applying very modern shapes, like from the hour markers and things like this um, to the, 
to extremely classic pieces mm -hmm. like Color Travelers, mm -hmm. da 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 da. And for me, also sort of looping back in with, with Hublot, I uh, also recently, you know, bought, you know, I think that I'm almost rediscovering the, the classic fusion, for mm -hmm. example, of mm -hmm. Hublot through that lens. And all of a sudden, like, they were already doing that. Yeah. Right. Yes. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. that, it was all there. It was this sort of like, Materials, completely unexpected materials, completely unexpected shapes, da da da, with an extremely beautiful traditional shape yeah. that is, you know, fantastic watch to wear all day, uh, which is the one I, ju I just bought the the, the one um, it, with the the gold that uh, I think yeah Jay Z has I think in the there's like a really good picture of Nas with one too that I love I love the oh, classic nice. fusion I think it's a classic piece yeah and and I think I think I saw it. Yeah, I think Jay Z has it in the uh, Otis, the, you yeah. know, the Otis yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, video. So, so anyway, like that's something that I find extremely exciting, um, and I'm um, also exciting to see. For me, the one thing that I have been finding extremely alienating, and um, I know brands are working on it, but it's the 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 relationship side with the, the, the dealers and that this is also a thing that I thought Hublot has always had a very interesting perspective on because all the boutiques pretty much are owned by Hublot mm -hmm. like they or they have very close relationships with the, the franchises um, and and you will be welcomed in, mm -hmm. in the in the shops whereas you know we've heard or experienced sure. uh, you know how it's been um, in the past you know, half a decade or a decade with, with the other brands. And there's an effort there, and I want to see this effort get somewhere, for yeah. sure, because I think this is another one of those alienating yeah. things that has put off a lot of people yeah. were like, cool, I want to be part of that. And it was ultimately, they were like, nah, and I'm yeah. not sure I want to be part of that. And then the same, I told you yesterday, like with, with media, like I feel that, you know, this is why I love your guys podcast so much because thank you you know because i think you you're bringing this thing that is needed where where it, like i'm excited again to to look at a podcast you know the way i was yeah. watching you know the early talking watches yeah. and stuff like that collecting and designs in switzerland yeah, yeah. <laughs> so to your point you said that post covid you know people had to kind of like rediscover the brands had to kind of rediscover themselves also i feel like uh, not, we've mentioned them a bunch, and that's not to pick on them, but Patek in particular, it almost feels like they're getting younger with what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Like, they're realizing who their audience is now. It wasn't just old guys working in banks and, you mm -hmm. know, who could afford it. There's younger people who want their product and who love and are passionate about it. And I almost feel like every Watches and Wonders, Hugh blows like, we've been doing it. Yeah. yeah. And, and, that's, and it's like a reminder because they've been doing the, the Big Bang and the Classic Fusion since the 90s. Yeah. Right, like when Jean Claude Biver took over, he, he's the first person to say, "Let's mix metals. Let's put ceramic and gold yeah. on the watch." There would be no Oyster Flex Daytona if there was no classic fusion. Mm. Yeah, or oh, no offshore. Right, there yeah, definitely no. wouldn't be an well, offshore. offshore. And like th these brands, I mean, the people who know know, but I mean, you gotta start giving credit where it's due. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And for me, they're bringing so Hublot was really bringing it home, in my opinion, in the past couple of years with the Integral mm. uh, line, which is. Ironically, which is, I think is, is kind of cool and ironic that it was the last, the, that one thing they hadn't done is a sort of integrated bracelet yeah. kind of thing. Um, and, um, and I thought it was an extremely successful design. I know. And, and I have to say my wish or hope is that, you know, I'd love to get to do a, a real high complication at some point. This is, you know, one of my fantasies. Hang <laughs> <laughs> out I was going to say and, a calendar watch maybe. Well, yeah, of course, a or, or like, a, you know, Hublot <laughs> just released, um, I don't remember the name of it, but the sort of triple axis um, tourbillon um, at Watches and Wonders um, and has been doing, so I remember when, when I did an interview with um, Jean-Claude Biver uh, in the mid-2000s for a magazine that I had started then, um, and uh, they were about to release a piece called the uh, Clé du Temps oh. in their Masterpiece series, which is... Uh, essentially a piece where you can adjust the speed at which the time passes. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. which is awesome. And they have had these uh, masterpiece series, which is 
the highest level complications that that, that you, you know they're not including not traditional uh, uh, complications that like they've done this uh, this piece based on the um, that that uh, device that was found on a on a ship on a, a sunk sunken ship mm. uh, or indeed in that and um, and they have <laughs> <laughs> thanks I mean, no, no one can pronounce it <laughs> except uh, Orin. <laughs> and, and I'm like you know sometimes I like I want to tell people like hey do you do you realize that yes. it's been going on and, yeah. and I find like it's 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 in in the the honor of the brand that they're not trying to shove it in people's faces and like even when when they get you know criticized but like I kind of wish I kind of wish that was really brought to the to more g given more light because not a lot of brands have done that at all like I can't even think and that's of what any of my point was right and I think that I think to to your point when we start talking about you know where the watch industry is, is headed and you, you think about hype watches and how excited they get people you know what happens once they're on the wrist mm -hmm. they're great mm -hmm. but then there's that thirst for more right because now we've got people to like watches again yes. okay well where do we go from here yes and you know this sort of like um, artist atelier residency thing that, that Ublo was doing with gentlemen like yourself, I think is the future and the way to go. Because through you now, people are identifying timepieces in a completely different way, right? Because we're working with artists, right? When you think about some of those hype watches and who they were designed by, with artists, mm -hmm. right? So this is just a whole new era, right? And so we're, we're seeing it's cyclical, Right, kind of going back to what we were talking about before, which is interesting, but it's all brand new. And it's, I think this is exciting times for the watch industry. I think it's going to be a really exciting time for Eublo. Um, you know, I think that this partnership is, is pretty amazing. I'm, I'm looking forward to the release. Mm -hmm. I think the watch is fire. Facts. Um, and I think anyone that is familiar with your work, um, and even, you know, even though you can see how different everything is, there is a shared spirit between all of it, and it all makes sense. Um, I want to say thank you well, for your time tonight. Yes, it was, yeah, it was an honor. <laughs> I'm truly honored. Uh, this has been one of the better conversations I've had this year. We've had some good ones. Yes. Um, but to be able to, to talk about our passion for all of these things, art, design, graffiti, tattoo, and, of course, watches this has been truly special yeah, i feel like there's a little piece of all of us in this conversation absolutely yeah, um thank it. you thank you so much many thank thanks you, to the good people at ublo oh, for <laughs> allowing us in their space shout out to Oren. yes he's not on camera but you, you might have he's you might have heard him <laughs> <laughs> live and direct yes um this ends the 55th episode of risk check podcast yep. you guys know where to find us but if you don't uh, we're on YouTube. We're on Spotify where you can watch and listen if you just search Risk Check Podcast. Um, obviously, Instagram and TikTok for the children. And we are now on Amazon Music. So for those of you who are subscribed to Amazon Music, please search Risk Check Podcast. You will find us there. And uh, we'll see you next week. Peace. Peace.